Before we get started, we wanted to thank Liberty Mutual Surety for sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. Liberty Mutual Surety provides contract and commercial bonds for all size companies and contractors around the world. Liberty Mutual is here for you today, tomorrow, together. For more information on Liberty Mutual's breadth of surety products and solutions, visit www.LibertyMutualSurety.com. Now on to our show. You're listening to Let's Get Surety. Let me hear your bonding talk with Kat Shamapande. Hey everyone, it's Kat Shamapande. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Let's Get Surety. On with me today, I've got my co-host, Mark McCallum, CEO at NESBP. Hey Mark, thanks for being on. Uh, hi Kat, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> uh, today we have an exciting topic. We're going to be looking at some of the updates uh, to terms and conditions and consensus docs and some trends in the construction contracts generally. Um, to do that, we have with us Brian Perlberg, and he's the executive director and senior counsel at Consensus Docs. Hey, Brian, thanks for being on. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Brian, before we dive into this topic, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and about Consensus Docs? Sure. So my name is Brian Perlberg. I live in the Washington, D.C. area uh, and just outside. I'm a proud father of a great 11-year-old daughter who uh, keeps me on my toes and I try to stay active, both uh, being a dad to her and her, as well as uh, following sports and playing sports occasionally. And uh, Consensus Stocks, I have been here uh, since the get-go of Consensus Stocks. We've been around for 15 years. I actually have a double-sided business card. One is to work in-house at the Associated General Contractors of America, which I've done for 17 years. And then Consensus Stocks, which is my main gig, that has been around for 15 is a coalition where everybody is equal that started out with 20 organizations back in 2007 and now has grown to over 40 and we have over 110 standard construction contract documents that address all major project deliveries in the design and construction industry including design bid build design build seam at risk we're the first to come out with an integrated project delivery document and have also ha published a P3 document. That's terrific. So it's, you've been around for 15 years and the documents you're producing are expanding and continuing to change and grow with the industry. Absolutely. That's the whole point. Yeah, <laughs> that's terrific. Um, so if we're going to talk about some of the updates, what's, what's a good place to start, Brian? That's a hard question to answer in some ways because we've just actually, I'm really excited, just recently we had approval of our, our main general terms and conditions. And one of the things that we do that's a little different than other standard documents is we integrate our general terms and conditions and the agreement in one document. There's a few advantages of doing it that way. A couple disadvantages potentially, but overall seen as a good thing. And we have just gone through our review process and have approved our revisions. We do our revisions about once every five years, and then we don't just do it design, bid, build, and our general terms and conditions. We actually then coordinate those with our design, build, and see them at risk documents as well, mm. and try to put those out within, within a few months of each other. So it's a pretty big task, but we just went through the, the general terms and conditions that we could make a few more as we flow those down to the other documents. Uh, but the good news is we've, I've got a handle on what those revisions will be. And the really kind of gratifying things now having gone through the review process or comprehensive review a few times is that there's really a great deal of satisfaction uh, within the coalition of where we are and where we're going. So each time the refinements and the amount of refinements seem to be smaller. We all, mm. one of the things that, I pride myself on is, because this is kind of my job, is consistency and simplicity in our contract documents. My view is that good legal writing is just good writing. So we try to be concise and clear in our standard contract documents. So we'll make some tweaks. We're going to make a few more tweaks for clarity. But those clarity and consistency tweaks um, are, are pretty minor um, as we have uh, a better history of, of going through it. 
Well, you, you certainly sparked my uh, my interest. <laughs> um, you know, your general uh, terms and conditions, on, those are flagship uh, terms. So I'm very curious as to uh, what you all were looking at and what you felt like needed to change with the times or mm. uh, answer for whatever uh, issues that people were bringing to your attention. So there's there's two things that come to mind that I, I was anxious to address in this review process from feedback that we get. And, and let me just pause there. Not only do I think that having good legal writing that's clear and concise is a signature and something really important that we, we, we do better, but that, that needs to be done better in our contracts. And that there's, I, I think I've said this before, there, we'll never have a perfect contract. There is no one perfect answer for this, but we kind of keep trying to, to roll that rock up the hill as close to perfection as we can. <laughs> we get some feedback, right? And the industry changes. There right. was a little feedback. Insurance products are always changing. We had made a change in our last review process that included existing structures in some of the property insurance coverages. That's, that's basically hard to get. So we're going to be making some clarifications and, and basically taking some of that, th that difficult piece of the uh, builder's risk property insurance out. Okay. Uh, the, the big issue, uh, consequential damages is such an important issue within the design and construction industry and how those are addressed in standard construction contracts. We have a very nuanced, balanced approach that is good for owners as well as design professionals and builders. It's not a blanket, it's it's a limited waiver. It's it's basically a waiver of consequential damages with a discussion. Uh, and we, we, we segment out insurance proceeds. So okay. we're gonna make it a little bit clearer that they're actually not just the the insurance that you're you're supposed to get, but it's actually the insurance proceeds that are actually paid that are ex paid that are out. automatically excluded from this waiver. Th those are some of the big uh, items. Uh, there, there's some clarifications about how we have moved from uh, an interim directive change to an interim directive, and so in that the difference was if there's a change order that's not agreed to, it is a directive. And some, there's some language ab ab about that, but also we made it clear that if you're just giving field directions that may not impact pro time and price, uh, that that's a vehicle to do that. And, and we, we made that a little more clear uh, in some of the ramifications of what an owner is and is not improving when they go that route. So just to circle back, because maybe not everybody is familiar with the term consequential damages, can you just describe what you mean by that? Uh, what are consequential damages? So what I've heard and I've said this for a while now is that consequential damages are a little bit hard to describe. We have more language than other standard documents of okay. trying to differentiate this and define it. But what I've heard is that it, it's almost like the famous Supreme Court case where they said, you know, trying to dis to define um, pornography is that I, I don't, I, I'm not sure how to define it, but I know it when I see it. Uh, the, the short <laughs> answer is, is that when it's a direct cost, uh, it's a, a direct result of your breach or your, your contract breach, you're responsible for those. But what about things like lost profits? What about things like reputations that are not the direct result, but it's a consequence of, of that breach? And owners feel like that they have a lot more to lose on a potential consequential damages. And there's a famous arbitration case uh, that dealt with a gambling casino and that they didn't open on time. As, and as a consequence, they lost out on profits from a gambling casino. Hmm. Well, construction's a really low risk, small, uh, I'm sorry, high risk, small profit margin type of industry. And you can might imagine how quickly uh, a, a builder or a design professional can go out of business if they're going to be responsible for the lost profits of a gambling casino, not opening a week or a month on time. Mm. And so after that, in most contracts, people started excluding consequential damages. It, it sounds like one of the services that the form provides is that you're necessitating a discussion between the parties on what 
are consequential damages for the purposes of that project. Is that is that correct? And that's a great, absolutely, because there are there is some definition. But here's what happens sometimes. Oh, I exclude consequential damages in the standard. Oh, well then I get it, and I just get I exclude that exclusion, right? And and so that's what you have. What I would sometimes say is gamemanship or one-upmanship in contract negotiations. So whether or not that 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 happens or not is builders are really good at managing risk that they know and is defined, right? And owners don't like to write blank checks. They want to feel like the builders who they're contracting with, um, and design professionals for that matter, have some skin in the game. So they don't necessarily want to shift all the risk, but they want to feel like they have a partner in figuring things out when those risks arise. So the conversation is, if you're not going to exclude it blanketly, what What's the risk you're worried about? If you're worried about the dormitory uh, housing not being open on time, then you can specify that as the thing that you're excluding versus something else that, hey, we didn't realize this was going to happen. And all these other things happen as a result that when we were contracting, we, we didn't contemplate. Right. Yeah, I like that philosophy. So, uh, you know, there's obviously you you talked earlier about, you know, things are changing. Uh, consensus talks is in part then uh, reacting to changes in the industry as it should. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's a lot going on, uh, supply chain issues, integration of modular construction, a focus on uh, prefabrication to address, uh, you know, supply and things like that, Uh, lean principles. Are those the kinds of things that you are looking at uh, as consensus talks uh, in your documents, in your development uh, efforts? Absolutely. And we have now been around for 15 years, and all of those issues are things that, for, for whatever reason, I guess we have a better platform, but we've been agile and nimble to address these not just uh, existing practices, but emerging practices. Mm -hmm. We were the first to come out with a building information modeling standard contract document, or BIM. We were the first to come out with an integrated project delivery standard document and have come out with um, an IPD light or transitional documents as addendums to both our construction management as well as design build. And then more recently, you mentioned modular and prefabrication, and we were the only ones to produce a standard document that addresses that. Uh, we produced the one at the subcontract level called the 753, and now we are getting ready. We'll come out with a prime level agreement that addresses prefabrication. And it's really exciting because not only are we addressing best practices, best practices and fairness in, in, in the ex- the industry as it exists today, we're forward thinking and trying to figure out what's emerging. And what happens a lot of times is, and Mark, you're an attorney, I'm an attorney. A lot of times the attorneys say, you can't do it because we don't have, we don't have it addressed. And the easiest answer to give an advice sometimes is no, you can't. What's so exciting about what, what we do in consensus stocks is we provide solution off the shelf solutions that say, yes, we can, and here's how, and here's a way of doing it. And sometimes they're not, they're not one answer. They're best practice options that might even be a check the box, which we've embraced. But that's so much better because what happens otherwise is people will put in their contracts, use BIM, don't use BIM. You can rely on BIM. And then they, they, just, they have the field folks who are going to do it anyway because it's so much more efficient. And uh, so, so this is so much better to actually address things in a comprehensive fashion in your contracts rather than just do a one-liner. Well, you know, I think that's really interesting you, that you're, in a sense, facilitating the advancement of the industry uh, by wrestling with these things that otherwise may not get addressed because people don't know where to start. I, I imagine it gives you a lot of confidence when you're sitting at the drafting table and you basically have all the main constituents that need to bear upon these issues and hash out uh, some of the responsibilities and rights. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? 
particularly when it comes to like new or not so much new, but uh, maybe uh, concepts that really haven't been put uh, pen to paper, so to speak, like modular construction in a standardized form or IPD and things like that. Oh, the great point. And, and those relate to that we have great relationships and open communications and that we want to address those things with open ears. So the, the prefabrication documents is a great example. Uh, Tom Hardiman, who is the CEO of the Modular Building Institute, which is the organization that is the largest to represent modular builders. And he was on a working group that wanted to hear more about contracts. It's, it's a, an industry improvement that I think Nibs might have started, and he was just active in it. And we started talking, and then I had a, a, a Ron Ciotti, who is the chair of the AGC Contract Documents, had been working with some modular builders who were trying to figure out how to contract for this stuff. So both an identification from an association and a member who was dealing with this on the front ends led to, hey, let's make a proposal. Let's take this proposal to the Consensus Stocks Drafting Council. Uh, and then we had an interest in doing it. And it, it is exciting to work on those kind of contracts. And then what we did is through Tom, uh, we got, the, the, they've since joined Consensus Stocks that, because the process was one that was good for them. They contributed and then they tend to like it, right? And then they tend to want to be more. And then we got groups, I remember um, Associated Building Contractors of America, ABC, um, sent out an email and I got a, a slew of, of volunteers. And then I always get a slew of volunteers from the AGC folks uh, and others. So then we just create a working group and we had a working group of people who were with the prefabricators who look at themselves more in the manufacturing world. And we got a, a diverse role of both general contractors, subcontractors, but prefabricators, some who do it in different industries and have different views on how they do it. Uh, and what's interesting about that contract too is we've created a subcontract version, a prime contract. We're going to create a purchase order version. And then there's these different scenarios that because this is an emerging field, mm -hmm. and, and maybe we should delve a little bit into that, is w whether you're doing it off-site and then moving it versus doing it, trying to make the prefabrication like on-site and how much labor is involved. Like we, we might have to come up with like four different versions of these contracts to address these different scenarios. Wow. So I, 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 uh, I was remiss. I used the term earlier lean without defining it, but then I'm going to shift the risk and ask you to define <laughs> it and then how you are, are uh, imbuing some of your forms with uh, lean principles. Well, good. So one of the things that I say is that project delivery method is determined not by what you do culturally. It's determined by what's in your contract. And those are the structure. Those are the lines of what project delivery method you're using. Design, bid, build is still the most used from what I see from ENR and others in the industry. Uh, there's design, build, there's CM at risk. And then in the past 15 years, we've seen the emergence of a fourth major project delivery method integrated project, um, IPD, integrated project delivery. And, and some people call it integrated lean project delivery. Well, those are based on your contracts. And we have an integrated form of agreement, the Consensus Docs 300, which was the first standard document for IPD. Uh, and that was based upon the Sutter Health Agreement and Will Lichtig, and then in our redraft, Will was actually the co-chair of our IPD working group along uh, with Joe Cleaves, who has worked on billions of dollars of IPD projects that, uh, that folks like GM are using in the Midwest. So the structure, the skeleton of the, uh, of the organism is the contract, and that is integrated project delivery. Lean is, are, are the muscle, it's the tools, it's the processes that mm -hmm. you use as part of that. And so you, some people don't write lean into their IPD agreements, uh, but but you should, and that there's a, a nice triangle looking at that of the agreement, 
uh, the commercial terms, and then the processes of how you get there is that makes the triangle of the structure all the better and stronger. So what you do see is sometimes people have non-IPD or, or non-integrated documents, um, and they'll have like scheduling specifications that have very strict scheduling traditional mindsets of how to do things. And so people sometimes have a schedule for the contract. And then they said, hey, you know what? We really like last planner. And that the last planner is a way of pool, pool planning and pool scheduling. And we're going to do that. So we have one schedule for the contract that is sort of a, a fake schedule. And then you have one that they're actually using because those are lean, that they are, instead of a command and control way of the superintendent saying, you're going to do this, you're going to do this now on this schedule, and then that not happening and flowing, making everything out of whack, uh, that that this is a pool planning and, and other lean tools of having right. a big room and all of those other type of processes, like we're going to actually embrace that. Wow. So it seems like you, you've uh, consensus talks has done a lot, um, you know, reflective of uh, new developments, advancing developments by putting them, as I call it, pen to paper. Um, what are some of the other documents that you might foresee in the future in terms of development? Are there ones under consideration now? You know, I think sometimes when we, well, first off, I'll say another one we're doing in that realm we've already published is the design assist document, which is oh. a sort of a, a way that people are using all the time, but they, they say they're doing design assist, but like, what does that mean? So right. it's a range of pre-construction services uh, that we put into paper. Uh, we have those lean addendums documents that help you make your CM at risk project a little bit more integrated. Uh, what are we doing in the future? You know, I just had a conversation uh, the other day of people say, well, like this is their traditional role and this contract is it's got this mindset of uh, uh, that there's an owner and then there's a design professional and everybody's in their like their buckets. Right. Right. And I feel like what we might want to look at is a couple things is having versions of our contracts where you say, well, what, maybe that's not the mindset. Maybe I'm an owner that has uh, more construction expertise and design expertise, or that, that I want to do it a different way, or I want to have something. Maybe we'll ask questions and say, hey, what, what if I have a version of my a role of, of different players, and maybe, maybe I want to have something a little more integrated and ask some questions and see how that gets flowed through through a contract almost automatically versus making modifications to a standard. Right. So uh, needless to say, uh, not all consensus talks uh, have been developed yet. So <laughs> more to come, right? And Brian, if anyone <laughs> wants to get access to um, the consensus docs, the, the contracts or the bond forms, wh where should they go to do that? So just go to consensusdocs.org. And go to our website and we'll be happy that you can get a free sample by registering or you can, there's a form that you can reach out and, and get those to us. Uh, and there's a lot of great free resources on the website. That's terrific. So there's a lot of resources to help people looking at those and give them some more information behind the, the actual documents and contracts. Absolutely. And we have a toll free number that you can call and, and, and people that give you free training. That's terrific. Well, I just want to I want to thank you, Brian, for being on with us, talking about some of these trends, um, what you see coming and, and some of the things you've addressed, like prefabrication and lean in, in the consensus stocks. Thanks for being on with us today. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Let's Get Surety, brought to you by the National Association of Surety Bond Producers. For more information about the NASBP and its members, visit nasbp.org. Before we go, we just wanted to thank Liberty Mutual Surety again for their generous support in supporting this episode of Let's Get Surety. Liberty Mutual Surety provides contract and commercial bonds for all size companies and contractors around the world. Liberty Mutual is here for you today, tomorrow, together. For more information on Liberty Mutual's breadth of surety products and solutions, visit www 
www.LibertyMutualSurety.com.